Hey everybody, welcome to this new live stream about Microsoft Sentinel in cooperation with Azure Flog and my own personal channel. Thank you for tuning in and taking the time to join us. We'll have some great content and epic demos in the next hour. Uh, and go ahead and make it interactive. We'll be watching for your questions on Twitter, LinkedIn, and YouTube. All right, before we continue, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on the situation in the world, because these are tough times for the people of the Ukraine and our hearts and minds go out to all that are under attack right now. We are hoping for a quick end to an unnecessary conflict. In this live stream, we will not be referencing anything with regards to the war or any related cyber attacks going on right now, nor are trying we to exploit the situation by promoting any specific technology. All right, this live stream is about three years anniversary of Microsoft Sentinel because actually exactly three years ago on February 28th, uh, 2019, Microsoft launched my, uh, Azure Sentinel and uh, today we'll be looking back and uh, also looking forward uh, to what's coming next. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Maarten Goed. I'm an MVP since 2007, and I'm also regional director since 2015, and I'm a pilot, so I do fly the real clouds, and I'm the founder of Experts Live, uh, which we hope to do some in-person conferences later this year again. And I'm here today with um, Koos. Hello, everybody. Yes, my name is Koos. I'm a uh, security consultant working for Wartel. Uh, mainly focusing on Microsoft Sentinel lately. And in my spare time, I'd like to do some, uh, some barbecuing, some smoking, uh, or taking the mountain bike out for some trails, or uh, playing some board games and uh, some pinball. Jeroen, can okay, you introduce so, uh, yourself? My name is uh, Jeroen Niese. You might uh, recognize me from my YouTube channel, Azure Vlog, on which we are also live today. It's the first live stream on Azure Vlog, so cool. Um, aside from uh, working in IT as a, uh, um, in the security, I'm also uh, a fan of the barbecue and I'm also a drummer. I play the drums for, uh, for those who don't know. Um, and I have a development background. So that's about me. Well, cool thing that we're uh, first time live on your channel today. Um, as everybody's seen, we're using the Back to the Future theme a bit to play around with and uh, show you the context of uh, Sentinel over the years. And like I said, exactly three years ago, Microsoft launched Azure Sentinel through an announcement on their blog and people could start playing with the public preview. Uh, but I'd like to dive a bit into how it all started and how the history of Azure Sentinel came to be. So I think for me personally, uh, it started with uh, over 20 years ago, uh, about uh, a month ago, 20 years ago, Bill Gates sent a memo about the Trustworthy Computing Initiative. And looking back at 20 years ago, the environment was quite different. Sometimes systems could be unreliable. Uh, you had the first major viruses like uh, I Love You or worms like NIMDA that maybe people will recognize. And so there was really a need to step up the game and make sure that systems became more available uh, and more reliable. So the pillar that my, the memo that Bill Gates sent out was on three pillars. Uh, products should be more available and always available when customers needed them. Uh, users should be in control of how their data was used. So a privacy pillar and certainly last but not least, the data and the software of, uh, and the services should be more secure and protect users from harm and uh, any modification that uh, was inappropriate. And so this memo was sent around and you saw that uh, instead of just focusing on feature development and adding new features to products, Microsoft started investing a lot into robust security, robust privacy and robust availability throughout the platform and throughout the products. And also, if you look at Microsoft and security, um, they were sharing their knowledge already since 2005. 
actually this week in Israel, there will be a new Blue Hat in-person conference uh, sharing the newest security uh, uh, items, uh, but Microsoft has been organizing the Blue Hat conference since 2005, and uh, certainly uh, a long time. Also, if you look at the strong lineup of products, Microsoft has been investing in security over time. Maybe people recognize the Forefront suite or ISA server or just general security features in the platform. And so this was something that didn't happen over the past three years, but was really an accumulation of everything they did over the past 20 years. But looking at their financial report last year, 2021, you saw that Microsoft security alone, so their Defender suite of products, Sentinel and much more, is already a 10 billion plus industry right now. So this is really serious business and Microsoft is a big player, I guess, in the security field and many companies and persons today uh, are trusting them for their security. Now, going back to a bit of history, then you saw that Microsoft had in the time a service called Microsoft Audit Collection Services or ACS, or jokingly, it was called Max. And before 2007, you could ring up Microsoft Premier Support if you were a big enterprise customer, uh, get a copy of ACS and use that as an aggregator, as a collector really, to uh, collect all the events in your network, all the Windows events, and then collect them in a central repository to report on. About 2007, when Microsoft launched System Center, and of course then also launched System Center Operations Manager, you saw that audit collection services became a part, an integral part of SCOM and you got a dedicated infrastructure for collecting those Windows events at scale uh, throughout your network and throughout your data center. It was brought with extensive reporting capabilities. So through SQL reporting services and SQL Server, you could ring up some of the reports and look at who was using RDP, who was logging in where, some login fields, etc. But it wasn't really security management yet. You did have programmable interfaces, so there were, for instance, a WMI interface, which you could query that in ingestion time, you could do a WMI query to see who was logging into a server and maybe log an alert or log something based on that. But certainly not a real SIM or security management just yet. The audit collection services was a dedicated infrastructure. You had big SQL clusters that could support it. And personally, I knew of a lot of customers that were using it to at least have some audit way and have some way to collect all those events. And uh, I presented about that in Microsoft Management Summit 2009, and there's recording available at, uh, at this link. So System Center was front and center uh, at their security uh, uh, approach. Uh, alongside Microsoft Forefront, which was the label for some of the security products. So uh, manageability and security going hand in hand. And a logical evolution uh, about 2016 was that Microsoft launched the Operations Management Suite, OMS, which was really to complement System Center on-prem, having a cloud service that you could extend on and that could help you get insights into resources running in your environment in the cloud, together with all of the resources in your data center. And as you can see in the screenshot right under, already some of the first signs were uh, visible about security and auditing uh, capabilities that OMS had. Uh, and you see with the tiles as well that it was composed of several solutions that through a store of sorts you could actually install and you could get more solutions to be available in your environment. And this was really the precursor to what would be happening next in the cl cloud security uh, approach that Microsoft was taking. So 2016 OMS, uh, around 2017, Microsoft announced Azure Log Analytics, which we still know today as uh, a way of storing items and information in the cloud at scale, for instance, for Azure Monitor, but later, of course, for Azure Sentinel. And then people paying attention saw that Microsoft was starting a project uh, probably referenced to as Orion uh, with some of the early steps into thinking how could we build a cloud native SIM. Now around the end of 2018, you saw a preview uh, with the name of Azure Security Insights and even today in some of the um, APIs you could see references to it. But like I said, February 28th, 2019, Microsoft launched Azure Sentinel and everybody could start using it. And uh, from what I've heard, it was a rocket launch. A lot of customers had immediate interest and were trying out uh, the public preview. 
Now, Cozy, you don't will be talking about the current state of affairs with uh, Microsoft Sentinel, uh, but over the past three years, Microsoft really had a relentless pace of innovation and features and, uh, and brought to you a lot of capabilities that complemented uh, their cloud native uh, SIEM solution. Uh, around Ignite last year, so around November, Microsoft renamed Azure Sentinel to Microsoft Sentinel. And this is where we are today, three years on, with the full cloud native SIM that works together with Microsoft Defender in uh, really great ways. Now, the history is also that Microsoft started building out the community and the community start forming around the Microsoft and uh, Azure Sentinel solution. Uh, today, you still see that there's a big GitHub repository where a lot of information is stored. You can contribute to it, but also Microsoft themselves are sending information into the GitHub repository that you can just use and take and that is shared with you, even if you are not a Microsoft uh, Sentinel customer. Uh, Microsoft Israel, their development center in Herzila, was really empowering that uh, community. Uh, a big shout out to Eliav Levy, Kobe Koren, and Over Shesvav that have been really working with community folks, MVPs, non-MVPs, customers, and who have you, partners to really make sure that, uh, that there was a well-adopted situation with Azure Sentinel. Uh, but the community also came together and a shout out to our great friend Puyan Kapasi uh, to really fill some of the gaps in the early days. So we've built an Azure Sentinel PowerShell module that I know a lot of partners and customers were using to automate some of the tasks that they were having in, uh, in their environment together with Azure Sentinel. And of course, numerous blogs, ebooks, vlogs, and what have you to support the knowledge around Azure Sentinel. Personally, I think Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center, uh, short in Mystic, uh, is something that also makes a big difference in history in making Azure Sentinel and Microsoft Sentinel a solid solution. Uh, they have a big group of people that play a key role in threat intelligence, uh, publishing indicators of compromise and other important detections that you still see today in the GitHub repository in the product, but also in things like Jupyter notebooks, uh, where they share their knowledge, share their tooling, uh, and all of the things they are doing, not only with customers on the platform, but also with nation states. And I urge you to look at uh, or listen to one of my podcasts where I talk to Kristen Goodwin to really understand how Microsoft Threat Intelligence Center is working, but also with Ram Shankar, who's working with some of the machine learning technology that's empowering Microsoft Sentinel. Now, jokingly, two years ago, I wrote a blog called Not Your Daddy Splunk, uh, which even today is, uh, is my most read blog. Uh, just outlining the fact that it is not just a cloud native sim. It's not just about collecting events, putting them in a repository, and then asking you to make sense of it all. No, it is something that is powered by machine learning, where we're automating a whole deal, where we're correlating out of systems, where we have a SOAR in place to really help you with responding to some of these attacks. So Microsoft Sentinel certainly is not your daddy Splunk. But uh, you were mentioning SOAR. What, what is a SOAR? Uh, Koos, can you explain that? Yes, I can. Well, I uh, first of all, I know for sure what it's not. And what it's not is that it's referring to soaring through the air on your hoverboard to staying into back to the future references, of course, so for today. No, SOAR stands for uh, Security Orchestration Automation and Response. And um, I grabbed uh, two lines from the uh, definition as stated by Gartner on their website. Um, it all comes down to um, leveraging uh, machine learning uh, to make uh, the, the triage and uh, an incident response a little bit easier. That's what Microsoft calls uh, uh, fusion in Sentinel. Um, we'll have a short look at that later. Um, and the other part is related to standardizing your response actions. So when a security analyst investigates a security incident, they will quite often repeat the same tasks over and over again. Uh, for example, maybe uh, doing some uh, evidence collecting to get a file reputation, for example, or maybe look at sign-in statistics of that, uh, of that user. So um, the same as uh, Doc Brown in the movie did when he wanted to feed his dog every day, he built some automation around that so that he doesn't have to repeat the same steps over and over again uh, on a daily basis. Um, 
what it looks like in, in Sentinel when you enable Fusion, and it's enabled by default, uh, but more details on that later, you'll, uh, uh, you might see incidents like these when a certain uh, multi-stage uh, attack is, uh, uh, is detected by the machine learning algorithms. And what it can also do is correlate for you, intelligently correlate multiple incidents from completely different analytic rules uh, together. In this particular case, um, an alert from Azure Active Directory Identity Protection was correlated to a detection uh, which was based on a scheduled analytic rules. In this case, based upon some Windows security events to detect multiple password resets. And another example here where uh, Again, identity protection alert uh, for an atypical travel was correlated on the same user within a certain time frame uh, with some rare application consent. And when Fusion thinks multiple uh, incidents are related, it will automatically raise the severity to high to make sure that it, uh, it receives some uh, extra special attention uh, from you. So again, Fusion is enabled by default. Uh, you see a rule type with the type Fusion. You only have one of them. You cannot create them yourself. It's just there. You can disable it. But I want to address this, that you make sure that it is configured correctly because every product you add to Sentinel and also your own custom rules, you have some fine tuning options here. And you also have the ability to um, to do some exceptions, to do some exclusions. You can do that straight from the Fusion incident, and then it will add some uh, specific detection patterns to that uh, below in this uh, screenshot. So maybe it's a good idea to check if this is all uh, enabled. Moving on to another part of the statement we saw earlier, uh, we want to drive the standardized incident response action. So those repeating actions, uh, the security analyst uh, will perform. Um, again, they might be uh, want to check the sign-in statistics, uh, the user that, is, that has uh, triggered the incident, uh, what IP was the uh, was last known for that user, what what last logon, uh, where did it came from, uh, what agent was used or was MFA used, for example. Um, steps you also see repeated quite often, as mentioned before, some file reputation or reputation on a URL or an IP address, um, or uh, maybe uh, uh, looking up your entities or your indicators in external or internal threat intelligence feeds. For now, I'm going to focus a little bit more on those uh, reputation scans. In this case, uh, with Virus Total, I think everybody uh, is aware and is familiar with this uh, tool where you can upload a file hash or a file or IP addresses and, and check its reputation uh, and see what, uh, what kind of file uh, was triggering uh, this incident. And this is actually something you can uh, fully automate within Azure Sentinel. Um, with the use of Azure Logic Apps and some APIs from uh, Virus, Virus Total, uh, You only have to request an API from them. Uh, you can do this for free with a certain limits, with certain limits on how many times you can query it uh, on a day, daily basis. And they obviously also have a paid uh, version so that you can uh, use it for all your incidents. And uh, I would actu actually like to uh, demo this to you um, and uh, go into more detail on that. So let's head over to the Sentinel incident overview, where I've prepared an incident with some file hashes to show you uh, how you can automate the virus total lookup. Um, in this case, a malware was detected in a zip archive file. Uh, it was detected by Defender for Endpoint. And as you open the incident, you can see that several entities are attached to it, uh, certain file hashes both in SHA-1 and uh, 256 versions of them. And um, yeah, well, normally you can go to the virus total page and paste these in and see if the, the files are, uh, are known or what the reputation uh, could be. But in this case, uh, two comments were already added to this incident uh, right after it was triggered. And if I look at the comments, we'll see that uh, several additions were made um, for each of the respective files. So either the, the, the zip file itself and its contents. 
um, complete with analysis, reputation, and you can even link to the full report and see some more details there. So now this is automated and the security analyst um, doesn't have to do this manually anymore, so that, which is great. Um, so how this is actually done is with a Sentinel automation uh, automation rule uh, with a, uh, with Azure Logic Apps. So Sentinel leverages Azure Logic Apps for all of its automation uh, tasks. And the way how this works is with some automation rules. When I go into the automation rules, you'll see that I have a automation rule set up for enriching incidents with fire to fire total scan results. And when I open it up, you'll see that this is affecting all incidents um, but only if the incidents come from a certain product and in this case i've decided to select the fenf endpoint here because i know that those are more likely to contain file hashes um, the action is in this case run a playbook uh, one important thing to know is that uh, within the playbook and i'll show you that later you have two different triggers you have an incident trigger and an alert trigger. Automation rule, automation rules like these trigger on incidents. So you also need to provide the incident trigger inside the logic app. Otherwise, your logic app will not show up here in this list. Um, and the same goes from, for triggering uh, logic apps from alerts, but we'll see that in another de demo uh, tonight. So this is the action. These are the conditions. You can obviously add more actions, like maybe changing the severity, the owner, the status, etc. And you can also do that from within the logic app, but I'll, uh, I'll show you that in a second. So now let's move over to the, um, the logic app itself. So this is the, the workflow logic app designer, where you can see a visual representation of all the steps that are taken. Here you have that incident trigger. So that again, that's important. Choose your correct trigger when you start off. Um, a recent addition, which is nice, are some steps you can add to retrieve the entities from an incident, which is great. Uh, they have uh, uh, user accounts, IP addresses, file hashes, and maybe also URLs. I'm not 100% sure, sure on that. But that's an easy way to retrieve the um, IP addresses and file hashes, et cetera, from the incident and separate them into uh, uh, separate um, variables so that you can process them separately. And in this case, uh, we're going to loop through all of the IP addresses, if there are more of them, and all of the file hashes. And one extra addition you'll see on the left here with the file hashes is that I initialize an array beforehand. And after the results come back from VirusTotal, I'm going to use that array again, show you in a second. So I'm going to loop through all the file hashes. So this is actually an output from uh, the previous step here. And the nice thing of VirusTotal is that they have actively created a logic app connection uh, for their services. So you don't have to create and construct the HTTP request with the API key and everything yourself here. So you can just add your virus total step. Uh, it will ask to create an API connection and you have to provide your key and then everything goes automatically. So you only have to provide your file hashes, for example, here as an input. And the output will give you a very long list with a lot of different uh, parameters you can work with. So I have an, a condition here. If the um, if it's not reported before, and here is where the uh, array comes in, I, um, uh, I initialized uh, earlier. So if the uh, variable does not contain uh, a data ID from uh, virus total yet, then it will go move forward and add the incident, uh, add a comment to the incident. Um, and the reason why I did that, uh, at the end, it, uh, it will uh, uh, fill the uh, array with the data ID uh, because it will loop several times through this. And this is actually a trick I learned from a, from a customer a while ago. Um, the, uh, as you saw in the incident, both the SHA-1 and the, the, the SHA-256 hashes are attached uh, for the same files. So otherwise you will get duplicate comments in your incident. So once 
it is written to uh, to Sentinel. The array is filled, and then when it loops back here, and we'll see that here in the um, when I go to an uh, to a real run of the last time, you'll see that for every run, the two runs were uh, uh, were triggered because sometimes the entities come in later from the vendor for endpoint. In this case, the first file came in with two file hashes. So we have one shorter file hash, the SHA-1 file hash, and the next run, it will contain the other hash for the same file. So the first time it will uh, gather the output. And since it was not reported before, it will go uh, for true. And it will add a comment to the, uh, to the Sentinel incident, and then it will fill the array. So the next time the loop will run, uh, it will skip that part, as you can see here, because it is false. Uh, there is a value in there, so it will just stop here. Uh, it will stop the logic app. So the comment in Sentinel uh, can actually be written in HTML, which is great, so that you can create your nice, um, some nice layout. Uh, we saw some tables uh, in here. Uh, you can use some nice uh, markup uh, to make everything pretty. Um, yeah, so this is HTML uh, constructed. Um, and you might not be able to see this properly here in the interface uh, because it looks kind of messy. Um, but there's a neat trick I would like to share you uh, with this. So if I look at the straight plain HTML, which is in here, it looks something like this. Um, Another trick I learned is that you can even use some if statements in here. So uh, we saw that VirusTotal not always comes back with the same information. And sometimes certain value, values might be empty. And you don't want to end up with ugly empty tables or uh, uh, ugly um, uh, layout in your uh, comment. So with this if statement, you can actually uh, check if a certain uh, parameter has some values then it will uh, concatenate uh, a part a piece of html code for you and if the results are empty it will just uh, output null so this whole part will be skipped and the same goes for uh, for the next part um, so this is just regular html but when the uh, when you want to put the html in here it's easier to go into the logic app code view you'll find all the steps defined here in uh, in the json format and here you can find the message uh, uh, in a single line string. It's important to keep in mind that obviously, since this is JSON, you need to do proper escaping for double quotes, for example, and other kinds of special characters. And it should be one single string. So one way we could solve this is maybe by providing this HTML file on our uh, Git repository where it's easy to read and easy to update if you want to do that in the future. And with our deployment, when we deploy the logic app uh, with maybe an ARM template or something like that, we can automate the process in our pipeline where we flatten the HTML file into a single uh, a string with proper JSON escaping. And one way to do that is maybe with PowerShell, for example. So um, let me show you with PowerShell, you can obviously read the HTML file replace some carriage return and new file characters, which are in there to make it a single line and convert it, convert it to JSON. And then uh, the results would look something like this. And this looks like a mess right now, but if you look closely, this is actually one single string with the flattened uh, HTML uh, file in here, the same as it was uh, uh, defined here. So this is just a neat trick to work with HTML in the, um, in Sentinel comment fields. And recently, which is also a nice last Tuesday, actually, uh, Microsoft announced that they increased the character limits for your comment fields in Sentinel. So before you had a 3K uh, a limit on there. So it was kind of hard uh, if you, uh, for example, had long uh, outputs, but also even pictures weren't, uh, weren't that easy to, uh, to work with. Uh, 
um, for example, if you use a service called uh, URL scan, where you scan your URLs, you get a neat picture back as a part of the results as well, where you see what the website did look like. It's nice to add that picture to the comment, for example. And before that was not possible because you will most likely end up hitting that um, the 3K uh, character limit. And now they've solved that. So it's now to 30K, so it's 10 times as big, which is great. So now you can even put some pictures in there as well. Okay, that was it. I hope this was useful and um, I hope your security analysts uh, uh, will be grateful with, uh, with some automation so that they don't have to provide these, uh, perform these steps manually every time they, uh, they see a file hash coming by. Yeah, and another good example of using automation, uh, I want to dive in straight into the next uh, demo actually, is uh, for leveraging Microsoft Teams to ask your user for input on an incident. Um, because a lot of the times the input from the actual user triggering the inc incident might be quite valuable as evidence in your investigation. And uh, now you can also uh, use Teams for that and reach out to your end user, collect evidence, Added to the incident and all of that fully automated without having any, any intervention needed. So uh, let's look at the next demo. Okay, we're back at our incident overview in Sentinel here. And this time I want to focus on a different incident, this time triggered by Microsoft Sentinel, where a rare RDP connection was uh, apparently uh, discovered. Um, this might indicate uh, some lateral movement. So that's something we need to uh, need to check. Um, from the incident details, I can see that a certain user called Marty uh, logged on in on a virtual machine from a certain IP address. And according to this uh, detection, it was a uh, rare uh, login for that user or uh, for that virtual machine. So it's something we need to investigate uh, a little bit further. And while the security analyst uh, investigates this, it might be helpful to ask this particular user for their feedback. Maybe they have a certain reason uh, which they can explain this uh, behavior with. So I can go ahead and click on view playbook, playbooks uh, from the timeline here, from the alert. And here I'll, I see all the logic apps um, with the alert trigger, uh, which I can activate manually or automatic from a alert. Um, in this case, I want to ask the user for, uh, for, for input. So I click on the automate response, ask user for input logic app I've prepared for this demo and I click on run and the uh, security analyst can continue their work and come back later and check if the user uh, responded. So how this works is we're leveraging um, some Teams integration with uh, Logic Apps here. So if I look at the uh, desktop from the user Marty, um, we'll see that the Teams uh, icon will uh, pop up and it shows that a new message is there from Power Automate. And when I click on that, you'll see that <clears throat> a question is formed a security incident is raised uh, related to this account. Um, a certain login on a virtual machine was suspicious and maybe uh, this user can provide some feedback. So you see some uh, predefined answers here and I can also uh, uh, put in some other answer like, uh, I don't know, um, had to install high priority uh, patches or whatever and the user can submit this. What will happen on the Sentinel side is once the page refreshes, you'll see that a new comment is added, uh, that the user did indeed respond and uh, his reply is mentioned here. So this could be, could be helpful and it's also much easier than that the security analyst should reach out manually to this user or pick up the phone or send an email or whatever. Um, so how this actually works, let me show the logic app here. Again, uh, keep in mind those different triggers. So this was an alert trigger so that I can uh, trigger it manually from an alert. 
this step is needed to get the incident information out of the alert because if you want to interact with the incident not the alert let's say add a comment or close it or change its severity you want the related incident information uh, available here in uh, in logic app so that's why we put in this step and the output from this step will provide me a lot of uh, values from uh, that incident so that i can later add something to that I need to parse the entities because, well, there might be more, multiple entities in there. Maybe uh, we saw an IP address and a host name, but in this case, we're only interested in the user account. So that's why we want to parse all of the entities. And with a condition check, we could check if the entity type is an account. And only then we are going forward to ask the user for input. If the type is, let's say, an IP address or host name, it, the results false and it will not attempt this action because it will obviously fail. We're using the post a choice of options as Flowbot user uh, from, from Teams integration from Logic Apps here. Here you see those predefined answers. This is obviously just an example. Uh, we have a lot of freedom here. Uh, also don't mention, don't uh, look at this hard-coded recipient, but that's just because for this testing, I only had an offline virtual machine here available, uh, which will not uh, provide me full, uh, fully qualified uh, uh, UPN. Um, but um, yeah, you see the, the, the information, the, the message here, uh, headline, you can pop, let it pop up as an alert, no, et cetera. And when the user responds, um, you can add a, uh, in this case, I'm going to add a comment to the incident. Uh, what's important here is this once this flow is running and I can um, maybe for easier reference show you what it looks like when it's running in a second uh, before the user responds. It, it can take some time before the user responds, obviously, and you want to have some timeout in place. Uh, depending on the results of this step, it will either add a comment to the incident telling me that the user did not respond in a timely fashion or that the user res did respond and then uh, provide them their comments and their selected option. Um, if we go to the history of this logic app, I can actually resubmit the last run. So we'll see what happens uh, then. So from the virtual machine, uh, a new question is raised. And we'll see from the um, from the latest run that it will keep running in this uh, loop until a certain timeout is uh, reached. So it's very important to um, to work with the proper timeouts. When you go into the settings of this task, you can provide a duration of the maximum running time. Uh, this action can run and wait for response. In this case, one day, you can obviously change that. And if the day has passed and no response was there, um, a different action is taken. And how we did this is by configuring the run after settings of each of those add comment actions. Um, within the logic app, every step, you can configure the run after settings and you can say, okay, only perform this step is the, if the previous step, for example, has timed out or skipped or has failed. And the other one should only be run if the previous step was successful. Okay, that was it. I hope this will bring you to new ideas of how to incorporate teams and maybe interact with the user a little bit easier uh, with uh, automation and logic apps. Yes, <clears throat> and speaking of teams, um, there's also another uh, neat little trick uh, which I wanted to show you while we're on that subject, uh, because you can also use teams within your security team to work together on uh, incident uh, response and uh, maybe gather, gather evidence uh, with your colleagues, work together, have a chat on, on and work together on the same uh, incident. So um, without further ado, let's dive in to my last demo of tonight. So it might be helpful sometimes to actually work and investigate an incident together, together with some colleagues. And for this, you can use Microsoft Teams as well, actually. So if we take a look, closer look at an, uh, another incident here, 
uh, this case, this time from uh, Cloud App Security. Uh, so it's funny to see that Sentinel sometimes still refers to the other products with their old product names. Um, because now Cloud App Security is, is, is quite recently renamed to Defender for Cloud Apps, but well, whatever. So in this case, um, an activity from an infrequent country um, doesn't sound too exciting, but let's say we want to work on this with a couple of colleagues from the security team. We can go to actions and select create team. Um, it automatically fills in the name for the team and we can decide who to invite to work on this together. In this, time, in this case, I will select the security analysts group and create a team. So it happens to be that our user Marty is part of this uh, security team. So by looking at his desktop, we can actually see what will happen. Uh, you'll see teams popping up, um, giving a mention of a new team created where the user was added uh, with the name of the, uh, the incident. So here we can share evidence, uh, have a chat with colleagues about our findings and um, once this incident is closed, it will also neatly clean up this Microsoft Teams team for us. So let's see what happens when we close this team. Prior classification, so this was a, I don't know, true positive, it's a, just close it this way. And what happens, you'll see here on Teams, is that the team will be archived immediately as well so that's uh, so that's nice that the old uh, teams will be cleaned up automatically once you close the incident so this is a short uh, example of how you can also leverage team to maybe uh, work more efficient together on this so thanks for those uh, demos Coase. i think uh, they are amazing uh, the next thing that we would like to show you is uh, the azure sentinel github integration uh, I, as a software developer, love Git repositories and GitHub and all the stuff that we uh, can do with it. Um, but why would you connect Azure Sentinel to a Git repository? There are some challenges that you might experience. Uh, there is an audit log in Azure Sentinel, but there is no exact uh, traceability of the changes that you do on your Azure Sentinel cont content. So when you change an analytic rule, it is stated in the audit log that something has changed, but the exact change and why it has changed is, uh, is not visible in there. Um, by default, there's no standardization of content when using multiple workspaces. You can use PowerShell or you can use the UI of, of Azure Sentinel to bring all those workspaces uh, in sync, but they are not uh, at sync totally. Uh, and most of the time when you're using uh, the Azure Sentinel UI, there will be a lot of differences uh, in the analytics rules of things that you deploy. That's the nature of, uh, of humans. Also, when you're dealing with multiple Azure Sentinel workspaces, it, it can be hard to have them in sync. Uh, for example, you are a big company and around the world you have multiple Azure Sentinel workspaces for the uh, geographical locations. Um, you need to manage them. And at this moment, it's hard to manage them at scale. Uh, and as a result of, uh, of, of those challenges, you might uh, spend a lot of time uh, and repeating tasks in the uh, Azure Sentinel UI. So what you want, you want to have a standardized configuration, one set of analytic rules, automation rules, um, that is standardized and that you can deploy to your Azure Sentinel workspace or multiple uh, workspaces. Um, you want to have your configuration of the analytics rules, the content of your uh, Azure Sentinel workspaces under version control. So you can track all exact changes uh, and you can also write comments why you change something. And of course, we want no repeating tasks uh, anymore. So Microsoft uh, created the, uh, the Azure Sentinel uh, Git connector. And this basically allows us to manage the content of Azure Sentinel. And uh, that is the, the automation rules, the uh, analytics rules, 
the parsers, hunting rules, etc. from a Git repo. And that gives us all the benefits that you normally would have as a developer. So you can create branches, work with uh, pull requests, all that kind of stuff. Um, and it also brings us the, the traceability because each uh, commit that we do to that Git repo, we can write a comment for that. And even better, if you're using Azure DevOps or GitHub, you can uh, assign your pull request or your, uh, um, your commit to a issue or work item uh, that stated why you uh, executed that change. And from a scalability uh, perspective, there are pipelines and actions that you can use to apply uh, the configuration at scale. So this is what uh, the situation would, uh, would look like. We have the, the analytics rules, the automation rules, playbooks, hunting queries, workbooks, etc. in a Git repo. And from there, we can use our pipelines to deploy them to uh, one or multiple Azure Sentinel uh, workspaces. And in fact, uh, let's use a little bit of uh, time travel and I will show you uh, how you can uh, do this. Okay, so we went back to the past. It's a couple of days before the live stream now and I'm going to show you how you can connect your Azure Sentinel workspace to a Git repository. In my screen, you already see the Azure Sentinel workspace. And if I go to the analytics workspace, you can see it's uh, it's quite empty over here. Also, when we go to, uh, let's say, automation rules, this is also quite empty. We don't have any incidents uh, over here. So this is quite a vanilla uh, Azure Sentinel workspace, a workspace that you would get when you start uh, deploying Azure Sentinel and going to use it for the first time. So if we go over to the menu over here, we have a thing called repositories. It is currently in preview, so things can change. Be aware of that. But this is the place where we can start connecting our Azure Sentinel workspace to a Git repository and get analytics rules, automation rules, and all kinds of things from that uh, workspace. Before we are going to connect that workspace, I already have prepared a Git repository. As you can see over here in my, uh, my GitHub uh, uh, page, we already have a repository containing analytics rules and automation rules. And let's click on, on analytics rules and click on a, uh, a rule. And if we go over here, we see a analytic rule specified in ARM. So we can see its, uh, its title over here, it's in the display name. We can see the description, severity, uh, the KQL query that is being executed, the frequency, the period, uh, the trigger, trigger threshold, everything that is related to your analytic rule. So all the settings that you can prepare in the Azure portal over here, when we go to the, uh, the analytics rule and hit uh, uh, create scheduled rule over here, all the settings that you can see over here, we can uh, define them in an ARM template. And this template it will be consumed by the uh, um, Git uh, to Azure Sentinel connector in a few moments to uh, create analytic rules based on the file that I have in my, uh, my Git repository. As you can see, I have uh, two files over here, uh, an analytic rule. This one has a sample rule for its name. And over here we have a rare uh, Azure activity uh, rule. The rule that I just showed you is more of a sample slash demo rule. It's not a thing uh, that you would normally use in your uh, Azure Sentinel workspace, unless you're doing demos. But here we have a more uh, real uh, analytic rule. So here's a, uh, a better query in uh, with comments in the query. Uh, the display name is set as you would have it in your uh, production environment. Um, 
entities are being mapped. Uh, this is a, a real analytic rule. So if I go back to my, uh, my Git uh, repo, I also have a thing called automation rules. And I have an automation rule in here. And just like the analytic rule, my automation rule is specified in an ARM template. So we see the things that you would normally see in an ARM template. And we have a resource of uh, the type automation rules. And in this uh, ARM template, we can define all the settings that you would normally define when you go in the GUI to automation and create an automation rule. So all the settings that you see over here. The interesting thing that I found is this is also a uh, kind of preview uh, feature and there's not a lot of documentation uh, around there. So I reversed engineered a lot and this is uh, what I came up uh, with that is uh, working and I will show you that uh, in a minute. But just like the analytic rule we have all the properties over here so we have uh, the trigger logic so it's uh, it's triggered when the incident title starts with sample we have some actions defined over here we update the status to uh, to closed with classification uh, undetermined and a an, uh, classification comment uh, that is stated uh, unknown it has an order it has a display name uh, and it will trigger when an incident is created. So now let's go back to uh, Azure Sentinel and uh, connect this, uh, this thing. So if we go to repositories, click add new. I uh, want to connect my GitHub. I want to connect from GitHub. We can also select Azure DevOps over here. They both work with... Uh, uh, git repositories click on authorize on my other screen i need to uh, insert my git credentials now i can select uh, my repository so you do nissan slash azure sentinel i can select a branch so this is quite interesting if you're working with a developed branch and a main branch you can create multiple azure sentinel workspace spaces and Test your uh, content first on your testing slash development workspace before uh, elevating them to your uh, main uh, branch by using a, a pull request. So what I want to, uh, for content types over here, I want analytics rules and automation rules. We can also define hunting queries, parsers, playbooks, and workbooks in our Git repository. If I go and click on create, it's now setting up the connection to Azure Sentinel or to GitHub, I must say. And it's, uh, it's ready over here. I see I made a, a typing mistake. So if we now go back to uh, GitHub, we go to uh, code. And uh, there is a folder called workflows. So this is where the magic actually happens. GitHub works with actions and Azure DevOps, they are known as, as pipelines, which are basically tasks that, uh, that can get executed when code has changed or commits have been done to the, uh, to the Git repo. And those two files are actually responsible for publishing my content. So the analytics rules, and the uh, automation rule in my case to Azure Sentinel. If I go to actions, you'll see that it is running right now. As part of the connection creation thing of Azure Sentinel to Git repo, it will start the first deployment uh, automatically. So let's wait a minute for that to be uh, complete. We can click on it. And we can see what it's uh, it's doing. It's actually uh, logging into to Azure right now. As soon as it's uh, logged in, it will uh, publish all the stuff to to Azure Sentinel. So it's now uh, going a little bit faster. 
and it's completed. So if we now go back to Azure Sentinel and we go to, uh, for example, analytics rules, you'll see that the analytics rules that I have in my Git repo are now being published to Azure Sentinel and I can use them from there. Also, you'll see that my, my automation rule, my sample automation rule with all the, the stuff uh, that's in the IRM template has been deployed. So that's a great thing. We can manage the content of Azure Sentinel in a Git repo. So, and that will help us being more scalable, uh, deliver better quality and um, being able to have the same content on multiple Azure Sentinel uh, workspace uh, quite easy. So now let's go back to the future to real Jeroen. So here we are uh, again. Uh, this is a live stream. So if there are any questions, please use the chat uh, uh, to, <coughs> to uh, carry your question and we will happy uh, to answer it uh, later on the stream. Um, Koos, are there any other features that we should be aware of? Yes, there are actually. Um, I thought while we are still in the current time in 2022 and before we head over to the future to look at some, uh, some things where Sentinel will be headed soon, uh, I thought to highlight some, uh, some other key uh, new features that were uh, quite recently announced. Um, so um, one of the most important things I think most people were waiting for is that now finally in, in the public preview, we have a long-term data retention. And um, the way this works is uh, uh, with a, uh, also with an addition of a new basic logs uh, tier, which is also nice. Um, people were uh, finding the costs of ingesting data into Sentinel can be quite pricey when you uh, onboard a lot of uh, uh, chatty uh, uh, devices like networking equipment, for example. Um, but sometimes you want to um, want, want to keep that data, maybe for compliance purposes, uh, or they might still be valuable for investigations to search uh, through. So now the basic log tier can be used for that. So you cannot build detections on it, but you can ingest the data for a much, uh, much lower uh, price. Um, so you have a reduced in the ingestion price and the data uh, from the basic tier can also be archived in the new archiving solution. I'll show you in a second. Um, the same as the current analytics logs. So the logs we were previously using up until this feature are called analytic logs, but now you have an additional tier basic logs. Um, the basic logs have a standard retention of eight days, which is very short. Uh, you cannot extend that. The only way to extend it is to extend it into your archive. Um, and then you can perform search jobs to search through your archive logs, but also more on that later. Um, and the queries you perform on the basic logs are charged separately. So within those eight days, if you want to query the logs, uh, you pay a little bit extra for that. Um, I don't want to go into the whole detail of the whole pricing model behind this, but I just want to highlight uh, some facts uh, about some things that might cost a little bit extra, which before querying your data was included in the price, of course. So you enable this on a per table level. So you, for now, cannot enable it on the workspace level just yet, the same as with your archive data. So you go into the table, uh, you, you leverage APIs to make these uh, changes. Um, but I expect Microsoft will add some UI options for this uh, as well. The same as what they did with the archive, uh, uh, sorry, the export, the data export feature uh, from Log Analytics. So with archiving, you have the option to archive both your analytics log, so the logs we all came to know up until now, and the new basic logs uh, tables into a separate archive storage. And there you can store your data up until seven years. And before we had a limit of uh, two years, actually, that was the limit from Log Analytics from the start. And it is still there. So your workspace still has a limited retention of those two years, but you can extend it into your archive. And if you want to retrieve data from your archive, you can perform 
restore actions, uh, run restore jobs or search jobs. And I will show you those uh, in a second. So the search jobs, uh, once you want to perform a search on your archive data, you create a job and you provide your KQL query. And the, um, the pro it will create a processing job in the background and you can run multiple of them in parallel. And the results will end up in a new table with a SRCH suffix. This will not impact your workspace uh, performance and the queries, and this is also a very good one, will not time out. So before you had some limitations when you wanted to query larger data sets, uh, you have some performance limitations, some timeouts on there, Microsoft uses to protect their platform. Uh, and with search jobs, you don't have that limitation. So you can go through really large uh, data sets. Um, there are some downsides, uh, however, you can only query one table at a time with a search job. So you, you don't have joins, you don't have unions, and you don't have any aggregation options, like for example, a summarize. So this is just a search to know if maybe something is existing in that data set, maybe a file hash, an executable a name, an IP address or whatever. Um, with archive jobs, you can retrieve the data in uh, what they call a hot cache, um, this also does not impact your workspace performance. It leverages some kind of elastic compute in the background, not an elastic computer, by the way, as mentioned in the typo on this slide, but uh, I, I'm now imagining an elastic computer, but well, whatever. Um, so for the additional load, some elastic compute is spun up by Microsoft and it will uh, create a hot cache with the results from your archive job and also again in a new table with the RST suffix. And in there you have the full KQL set of functions. So you can do everything as, as you can do on your normal data, but it might become expensive when you restore large data sets because you're charged on the amount of gigabytes or terabytes even uh, which you are restoring. And then I even believe you are also charged separately on the queries you're going to uh, perform on that. Um, so the search jobs interface will look like this. And the whole idea behind this is that you might want to search first uh, first through your data set. Um, and then if, uh, if, if you find what you're looking for, then you can go ahead and perform the archive, uh, uh, sorry, the, uh, re the, the restore uh, job uh, afterwards to, uh, to retrieve the data from your archive. So I think this is a welcome addition. Um, again, this is done on a per table level through APIs right now. So the way this works is that you pull out, uh, you perform a request to the table, to the API for the, for the table, and you define a total retention in days. And then your workspace already has an existing retention setting. Let's say this is 90 days. And then the platform automatically knows, okay, and it also shows you in the response, okay, your default retention day is 90 days for this table that will still remain because it's on a workspace level. You requested a total retention days of, in this, in this case, 730 days. That will mean that the data in the archive is kept for 640 days. Um, so that's how it works. So you, can, so you, you are not uh, forced to first fill up those 720 days or 730 days in the workspace before you can start using the archive. Uh, you can do that right away. And this is again, all done on a table level. So the next uh, uh, feature I want to highlight quickly is the integration of the Mitre Attack framework. Um, Microsoft started early on with Sentinel uh, when it was just uh, Azure Sentinel um, with uh, Mitre uh, techniques on their uh, uh, on, on their analytic rules, uh, and now they uh, finally have a full integration with the whole uh, framework. So you can uh, so you can see what kind of coverage you have with your existing analytic rules. Uh, you can filter on scheduled, uh, near real time uh, templates and everything. Uh, you can also browse through the tactics and the techniques to see details uh, from them uh, a little bit uh, similar to what you can do on the Mitre Tech Framework website itself. So I think this is a really nice addition. You create some kind of a heat map and you can see where your uh, where your um, uh, where, where you might have some uh, some holes uh, which you want to fill. Maybe you want to protect uh, add some additional rules for that. 
And lastly, I want to talk a little bit about the normalization, which is now built in. Um, uh, Maarten already mentioned uh, Over, Over Shizaf from Microsoft. I know he's very busy also on this. Uh, on this, he has a lot of. Uh, of he had he also recorded a several web webinars. You can uh, look on the on the website, and um, uh, I've actually also spoken with him about this regarding to an Azure Firewall uh, uh, parser I built for uh, for customer. Um, so what Microsoft tries to do is to normalize all of the the data um, in in Sentinel so that it's easier to find uh, certain things because a lot of different sources you use different column names and values uh, uh, across the board. Uh, Microsoft tries to align with OSEM, which is the um, Open Source Security Events Metadata, where it stands for. Um, but there are some uh, reasons why they cannot fully align with that. It has to do with some product specifics from Microsoft. And also Microsoft is a, v uh, is a big fan of uh, uh, camel case, as we know, so every term starts with a lower case, and then the second word is a is an uppercase. And OSIM uses a Pascal case, so you always start with a capital letter. So there are some minor differences, but if you are familiar with OSIM, you can st uh, start using uh, ASIM uh, quickly as well. Uh, so there are some um, advantages. Obviously, it will simplify the analytic rule development. Uh, for example, we recently saw uh, the log4j uh, uh, exploit, of course. Um, <clears throat> and if you want to create an analytic rule um, to look for uh, certain traffic on your firewalls or your web application firewall, you have to assume that the, let's say, the HTTP request or destination IP is in a certain column. Uh, and it's different for every customer, for every log source. And this will simplify that process because, because you just know that the destination field is always the same, for example. Um, also, the use of template rules from Microsoft is going to be a lot easier that way. Microsoft provides a lot of template rules in Sentinel, uh, but again, the, they rely on certain tables. For example, the common security log is a common table used by Microsoft when you onboard syslog uh, traffic, for example, from networking devices. But if you do it a little bit differently, and uh, maybe, for example, use Logstash uh, or any other uh, uh, custom integration to talk with the APIs of Sentinel, all of your data will be stored in a custom table. So then, of course, you can open up the template rule, make changes to the query, and refer to your custom table instead of that common security log. But it's much easier if everything is normalized. And also finding data is easier in, for our security analysts and our uh, uh, hunters, because if they want to look for a certain executable, they can just put it in the normalized parser, look for maybe a file hash or a name or an IP address, and they don't care what kind of logs are there and from which sources they might have come. There's an architectural overview um, from Microsoft, looks like this where the left part of the drawing is still to be announced uh, because eventually um, the, the, the way it works right now is with parsers. So you have source specific parsers, like for example, the Azure Firewall parser, which parses the Azure Firewall data. And then you have unifying parsers, uh, for example, to parse all DNS related or Windows process related events and where multiple source specific parsers are combined. Microsoft is working towards a way to, um, uh, to normalize the data directly when it comes into the workspace, but they're not there yet. So for now, the data is stored in custom tables in, 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 in certain fields, uh, and, and you create your own um, uh, source-specific parsers, or you download the, the ASIM-compatible parsers from, uh, from GitHub. Um, so this is something uh, work in progress still. There are a lot of uh, schemas already available. Uh, for example, the process events parser uh, uses uh, a combination of uh, Windows security events and even um, um, uh, Sysmon, and even Sysmon for Linux, which, which still isn't out there yet, uh, but they have already put it in uh, uh, these parsers as, uh, as part of it uh, to, to look for certain processes. Uh, this is an example of what the... Uh, source agnostic parser might look like, in this case for DNS. Uh, they use a union statement um, with uh, the isFuzzy uh, parameter, 
which ensures that the query will always run, no matter if you might, you might lack uh, one of those uh, sources uh, mentioned below. And it's also uh, good to know that um, there is always a, t um, a function used, in this case, uh, the DNS empty, that will create the columns regardless if there is any data for them so that the output is always the same. If you want to get started with ASIM, visit this website. It's a quite extensive documentation with a lot of references to, uh, to those webinars I mentioned before and also the GitHub pages where you can go straight into deploying those ASIM parcels from GitHub into your workspace. So the templates from Microsoft are um, all already available as normalized uh, templates straight out of the box. So they were recently updated. So if you go into the templates overview when you type in normalized, you will find all of those uh, template rules, but the parsers still need to be deployed manually. And that's also something that's Microsoft looking into, uh, I heard, to make this part of the, um, the product itself. But uh, well, for now you have to rely on GitHub. So that's uh, normalization. Also something I know a lot of customers are really waiting uh, to do. Okay, now it's time to jump into our time machine um, and ask our own Doc Brown, uh, Maarten, what the future <laughs> will, uh, will hold for us uh, when it comes to Sentinel. Well, thank you, Koos, and thank you, Jeroen, as well, for the great demos and uh, the state of the business with uh, Microsoft Sentinel today. And uh, I wish I could program the DeLorean to set us up to, uh, I don't know, 2030 and see where Microsoft is going with this. But with the relentless pace of innovation, I'm pretty sure that uh, we'll be even further along than we are today. Uh, but as we speak, if you look into the future, there is actually a big debate on XDR versus SIM. And you might wonder, like XDR, I know about endpoint detection and response, EDR, what's XDR? Well, there is uh, quite a discussion about the definition of XDR. Um, I think from a Microsoft perspective, we see that combining all of these detection and response technologies together might give you an XDR suite. Uh, but it's still nomenclature as we need to define uh, as an industry what we mean. Uh, but how important will XDR be versus SIM? What will be the role of SIM be? And I think to me, it's not one or the other. It's really about building some sort of neural network, some sort of coverage around your uh, business and all of the technologies in your business to really make sure that we can detect and respond to those threats in a coordinated way. And of course, by reducing the time to respond, you want to uh, make sure you block things or prevent things before they are happening. And certainly Microsoft Central have the central orchestrated way in handling that together with Microsoft Defender. And so looking at Microsoft Sentinel as something that's more than just a SIM, but like we saw things like machine learning, like a SOAR, together with uh, all of the endpoint and uh, cloud technologies brings us to a really full coverage uh, as far as our technologies need to be covered. And uh, if you want to read more about this, the whole discussion about XDR versus SIM, uh, how we'll be moving into this into the future, uh, you could look on uh, medium.com and follow people like Josh Salonis and Anton Shuvakin, who really have insightful uh, debates, I would say, about the whole future. Uh, pretty good things to check out and also follow them on Twitter. Looking into the future, I think uh, we cannot do a live stream without a quote from John Lambert. Uh, we've seen his African proverb where he says, uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go together, uh, if you want to go long, go together. Or the defenders think in lists while attackers think in graphs. I think there was one that stood out for me in the past couple of months. Uh, the principle of adequate protection, uh, protect to a degree that's consistent of its value. Hence, the security infra must be as valuable as the most valued asset that you're protecting. And I think that's the whole takeaway for the next three years. Start investing in security, start investing into security posture. And like we said, Microsoft has some really good things on their plate that you can look at and use for your business. Um, the community is much broader than just us three. Uh, Jeroen and Coase are doing a really good job, but there are a few people that stood out to us, at least uh, in the past three years. We're not going to mention anyone individually or name them all. It's going to take too long, but uh, follow these people on Twitter or wherever they are because uh, they are doing a really good job and love and shout out to them. Of course, uh, seeing a, such a great community coming together. 
Um, looking at the social media, I don't think we have any burning questions at this point. Um, so I think we've been pretty clear. So thank you, Jeroen and Coase, for all the great uh, demos. If at any point you feel stuck, uh, know that Wartel has a managed Microsoft Defender and a Mi managed Microsoft Senton offering running 24-7, 365 days uh, a week and a year. So thank you for, uh, for considering that. Uh, if you want to stay up to date, I'm running a blog on maartengoed.org and the podcast on securityinsiders.io. But certainly also shout out to all of the great articles that Coes has been writing over the course of the last few years on, uh, like he just mentioned, his Azure Firewall Log Parser, optimizing your Microsoft Sentinel pricing and way, way more. Check out medium.com slash at uh, for more of those great articles. Um, subscribe to my channel if you want to see any future of those live streams, but also look at some of the previous recorded live streams and go to youtube.com slash Shemata or subscribe here under. And of course, the same goes for Jeroen's channel, Azure Vlog, wonderful videos uh, with a bunch of coffee in it. Check it out uh, that describe Azure technologies as much as Azure Sentinel. So. From us, I want to say see you soon and looking forward to the next live stream. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye.